Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Bretton Woods Committee's 2022 annual meeting. Uh, welcome back to everyone who joined us this morning. We had an excellent opening session today on trade and supply chains, and we're very fortunate to be joined by IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gorgieva, who I'm sure will be sharing some more thoughts on this and other critical topics uh, in her discussion with John today. Uh, I'll be very brief so that we can turn it over to them. Um, the, the, the theme of this year's conference is confronting changes and adapting to new economic realities. And there is no shortage of those uh, facing the world right now. Um, this week's meetings are taking place against a turbulent economic and geopolitical backdrop uh, and really a confluence of crises. Um, uh, I don't want to keep the, the managing director waiting, so just a reminder to our audience that we will reserve time for questions at the end so that if you have questions, please submit them using the Q&A function and we'll collect those and then we'll call on you uh, towards the end of the conversation. Um, as I said, the, the managing director is with us. She really needs no introduction to this audience, um, nor does our vice chair, uh, Mr. John Lipsky. So John, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you to kick off our discussion with the MD. Great, thanks Emily, and thanks everyone for joining us, and thanks in particular to the Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva, for taking time out of what is the busiest, one of the two busiest weeks of the year uh, to share her views uh, with us, with the uh, Bretton Woods Committee membership. Very much appreciated and welcome. Uh, Managing Director, this, is, uh, uh, this day began with the unveiling of the latest World Economic Outlook forecast. So I'm sure uh, it's appropriate to begin this discussion uh, with uh, your views about uh, the latest uh, permutations and interpretations of the IMF staff about the challenges before us. Managing okay. Director, thanks for joining us and over to you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It is one of my favorite segments of these two busiest weeks of the year because I know I'm speaking to an audience that is competent, understands the institutions and cares about uh, their role. Uh, let me start by stating the obvious that since October, the outlook has worsened. Why? Because we live through a time when we deal with a crisis, upon a crisis. Uh, we still have the pandemic impacting the world economy. And on top of it, we have the war in Ukraine that has created uh, significant spillovers across the world. The COVID impact has already been visible in uh, January, when we revised downwards our projections. And uh, now we are doing this for a second time more significantly than the first. We finished 2021 with the hope that we are on a path to sound recovery. Growth in 2021 was in the end 6.1%, not trivial. But then we downgraded projections uh, to now 3.6% for 2022. And uh, we also downgraded slightly our projections for next year. Uh, so next year we project again 3.6% rather than a bit 0.2 points more. This is primarily due to the impact of the war. Why? Because we have dramatic shrinkage of Ukraine. Uh, that is on top of the tragedy of people there, loss of lives and tremendous displacement with refugees across borders and internal displacements now exceeding 11 million people. Plus, of course, distractions uh, across the board, infrastructure gone and uh, uh, businesses uh, interrupted. That it is bad. So for Ukraine, some 35% shrinkage this year, 
It's also very bad year for Russia, where uh, since uh, October, we are uh, downgrading um, uh, growth by 11%. But it is also quite negatively impacting the neighboring countries. Those that are more dependent on exports of fuels and foods and metals from Russia and also from uh, Ukraine and through impact on inflation, this has a spillover that is going fast and far. So let me say a couple of words on inflation. We were faced with it before the war. We know that interruption of supply chains and the fact that in some places a booming economy pushed demand, but supply didn't catch up, led to a accelerated uh, inflation. Now the um, uh, fuel and food prices in particular have put inflation in many countries uh, on steroids. So we have a clear and present inflationary danger in many places. Uh, just to get you to the numbers, uh, we project inflation for advanced economies at 5.7% for this year, for emerging markets and developing economies at 8.7%. And uh, we know that the spillovers are particularly severe when it comes down to energy security and food security. Uh, food security is becoming top of mind concern. Why? Because even before the war, there were bad harvests in a number of places, mostly due to climate events. And now when you take out uh, part of Ukrainian and Russian exports and you put a big question mark, what is going to happen with the next harvest that is hitting some parts of the world, North Africa, uh, parts of uh, actually parts of Africa, all the way to Indonesia, uh, in a way that is uh, that is really painful. So to sum it up, what we want to go up, growth has gone down. What we want to go down, inflation has gone up. In 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 human terms, we are in a situation in which incomes are shrinking but hardship is jumping, especially for poor people and especially for poor people in poor countries. So the natural uh, uh, focus on policymakers is to deal with the threat of inflation decisively and early, because we know when you don't have price stability, that undermines growth as well. But as they deal with, with inflation, inevitably, that makes another problem that the pandemic has elevated that much more severe. In 2020, the world borrowed extensively for a good reason to, to put a floor under the world economy. It was the highest increase in debt since the Second World War. In 2021, for most countries servicing this debt was not a problem. Why? Interest rates very low, monetary policy accommodative. For some countries, it costed them less to service large debt in 2021. No more the case in 2022. And in that sense, we are particularly worried for countries that are in that distress already and are now deprived of some of, in instru of instruments like the uh, debt service suspension initiative that was there for them until the end of 2021 in a year when they need help even more than at that point. So when we, we look at this picture, we should not forget the neighboring countries to Russia and Ukraine. Why? remittances, flow of refugees 
and overall worsening of economic climate. So if that was not enough, John, you add to it the risk of fragmentation in the world economy, the uh, slippage towards regional blocks or other uh, formations in which reserve currencies, payment systems, trade, supply chains are all disrupted. And how is this world going to function uh, is a very big question mark. We know after the war there would be changes. What would they be and how we make sure that they are not significantly reducing the, the opportunities for, for, for well-being of people? Uh, that is a big, big question for us during this week. Well, thank you for that very succinct and uh, pointed uh, uh, summary of the of the outlook, and of course, it's a, a concerning one. Uh, not only for what the, for the latest changes, but I presume if there are risks, there's still plenty of risk for slower growth, yep. but higher inflation. Mm -hmm. In other words, the the likely causes of additional slowdown are not going to solve the inflation problem, if anything, make it worse. Uh, you've mentioned the impact on low-income countries that we can see coming. Already, as you've mentioned, and you can find in IMF publications, mm -hmm. the burden of debt service as a percent of government revenues has increased four times faster in low-income countries than in advanced economies. We can see debt problems coming. Mm -hmm. The G20 has created the common framework mm -hmm. to attempt to deal with these problems with the need for reprofiling or restructuring of debt of low-income countries now that the debt suspension uh, initiative, the DSSI has come to an end. But the common framework doesn't seem to be making much progress. How do you assess the current effort and what seems to be holding things up? Mm -hmm. And is the common framework going to be adequate for dealing the problems that we can see coming in low income countries? Uh, the picture is indeed uh, uh, gloomier in terms of risks tilted very much to the downside. Uh, and we are in an exceptionally uncertain environment. In, we don't know how long the war is going to last. We don't know where it would get more dramatic, triggering more sanctions. We don't know whether the uh, uh, climate would play us a, a, a surprise. Uh, that, that is another shock, uh, whether we might see COVID resurfacing during yet another round uh, around the world. All of this uh, makes it uh, for a kind of a lower business confidence, lower consumer confidence. We see it, some of it in, in the data and you're right, that may, may trigger even further slow, slow down. We may be lucky, maybe we would have a upswing, but one thing we know for sure, inflation, has to be put under wraps. Major central banks do have to act and act decisively. In quite a number of countries, the picture is such that not taking action can de-anchor inflation expectations. And then we may be in a, in a very difficult place. So what does it mean? It means that that service is going up, up, and up. Uh, and as you rightly said, this is particularly uh, troubling uh, for low-income countries in that distress or near that distress. You know the numbers. You actually, uh, the Bretton Woods Committee has taken this topic to heart. Uh, you uh, co-authored uh, a very thoughtful uh, paper on this topic. What we see are three issues. The first issue is how to help countries act 
early on their debt situation? In other words, what incentives are there for them? Well, the obvious incentive is your revenues are being melted by debt service, but this is not enough when countries look around and they're not sure there is appropriate avenue to pursue. Why? Because the common framework has not yet delivered on the expectations we built uh, for it. Only three countries ask for uh, a treatment under the common framework. None of this uh, is completed. And uh, until those are completed, everybody else is in a wait and see uh, position. The second problem is that even if the common framework were to bring closure on one, two, three, all three cases, it has demonstrated that it needs to be improved. It has to be more timely and predictable. So if you ask for it, you know how the process is going to go. Yes, you know a, a, a bit about the process, but there is no timeline that you can count on. Two, the incentive to participate could be much stronger if countries, once they ask for the common framework, can lean back to debt service suspension. And we have been recommending it and it's kind of so far, unfortunately, it looks like it's falling on a deaf uh, ear. And three, we believe that we cannot just look at the universe of uh, DSSI eligible countries. What about countries like Sri Lanka that is not a DSSI, but is uh, now in a situation of that de basically defaulting on that and needing that uh, restructuring. There is of course also the big issue of creditor coordination, information sharing at par with each other, more transparency around uh, the issue of debt that also needs to be, needs to be addressed. So, even if, even if we have the three cases resolved, we still need to improve the common framework uh, for especially what we, we are likely to see as a more uh, dramatic uh, situation. And the third issue is when we have cases where the um, private sector is the bulk of uh, the obligations of a, of a country how to make sure that the private sector is compelled to participate. Uh, they, have, uh, they are included in the common framework, but it is still not quite clear that we have equal footing private sector participation. So what we want to see is uh, large creditors like China, like the private sector, that they take more a proactive approach to an issue that is going to hit not only the debtors, it is already going to hit the creditors as well. Uh, in our view, we have to continue from the, uh, uh, from the IMF to zero in on clear debt sustainability analysis that can offer a pathway to debt resolution and then try to bring everybody uh, to, to participate early, otherwise we are paralyzed. When that is not sustainable, we can't, we simply cannot step forward and help uh, countries. And some of these countries are under debt crisis and under a food crisis and under energy crisis all at the same time. Well, thank, thank you for that. That's uh, again, very, very succinct and clear. And uh, we certainly, our analysis uh, coincides with your own. And uh, we hope that the uh, common framework evolves into something uh, really effective. And mm -hmm. it's our view at the Bretton Woods Committee that it's going to require what we call procedural transparency. Mm -hmm. your, how you described as predictability as mm -hmm. to what's gonna happen. Uh, we're hopeful that the IMF will be allowed to provide uh, leadership in helping to form that procedural trans, uh, transparency and to help make this process work because it's going to 
be very, very necessary as you, as you point out. Now, let me move on to a, 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 an allied to topic, and that is the, one of the initiatives of the fund that was just approved was the creation of the Resilience and Sustainability Trust. Uh, this is the idea that the fund needs some longer term money and hopes to fund that for low income countries uh, using some of the SDR uh, allocation that went to advanced economies. Uh, how's that going? Mm. And uh, what's the prospect for success? Yeah. Well, uh, to finish on the on the previous topic, uh, uh, at the IMF, uh, we do we are concerned about the uh, uh, direction on the issue of debt, especially for uh, low income countries, but not just for them, for countries that are already in a very difficult uh, place. I mean, think of Lebanon, think of of, of Sri Lanka, just to name uh, uh, two. Uh, and we would like to play the role that the international community sees as appropriate uh, for us. Um, I, I, am, uh, I like the procedural uh, pre predictability you're describing. How, how did you call it? Procedural? Procedural transparency, we call transparency, it. Transparency, sorry. Uh, uh, I, 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 I Same knew idea. Same idea. Yes, uh, and uh, I do. I do think that we have no time to waste. Uh, it is not a matter of years. It is a matter of months. We have to move. Uh, going to the uh, resilience and sustainability trust, uh, we have uh, uh, promised during the annual meetings uh, that we will uh, strive to have the design approved by the spring meetings. And at that time, I would admit I was a bit anxious because it's it is new for the fund but uh, the IMF staff uh, delivered. And they delivered also because there was quite a lot of support outside of the IMF for this instrument. Why? Because very clearly macroeconomic and financial stability do need to be placed in a context of structural transformation uh, and the uh, right policies to support it. Uh, so if we are to play a role uh, in getting countries to build more competitive economies that are greener, that are digital, that are more resilient to shocks of all kinds. We cannot go with short term instruments. Uh, they don't fit the objectives. Uh, the uh, Resilience and Sustainability Trust at this point has two primary objectives climate transformation, moving to low carbon uh, climate resilient economy and pandemic preparedness. On both, we rely very heavily on working with the World Bank first and foremost, but also with other development institutions because what we have is we have knowledge around fiscal monetary policy, macro frameworks. Uh, we don't have sectoral knowledge, we do not have technical knowledge that these institutions have. So what we want is to align what we recommend and support financially with the uh, objectives of the countries, first and foremost, but also with support of uh, partners. Uh, we are aiming to start at 30 billion by October to have the uh, uh, RST to be operational. And we think that there is room to grow it 45, 50 billion, provided of course that we start, there is a pickup and it is successful. Quite a number of countries are interested to participate. We do have a requirement that the country has to have a program engagement with the fund, financial or non-financial. So we can anchor these longer term policies into sound macro framework. Uh, even with this uh, condition, uh, the, the interest is uh, quite uh, significant. Uh, where we are on the fundraising, a very good number of countries have stepped forward and they said we would support it. Uh, we, I expect during the spring meetings to have announcements, but I can tell you during our board meetings, uh, countries like France, Japan, China, have made a fairly significant announcements of what they are uh, seeking to, to commit, UK as well. And uh, uh, we, we, we do hope that 
the uh, universe of participants uh, is going to be quite, uh, quite broad. Uh, when we look at the uh, teams to work on it, uh, we want to have accelerated knowledge on these two issues, especially on climate. So very happy to say that today we launched our um, economics of climate change training program. Uh, we want to, to get our you know, bread and butter economists to understand the policy uh, framework uh, so they can integrate it in Article 4. You know very well what it means. It means that then we can be uh, credible in providing um, policy advice. So, so far, so good. The heroes are the those who have worked uh, on it from our um, strategy and policy department, from the finance department, from the legal department, and from the area departments. Because to have a good design, you have to ground it in those who are dealing with uh, programs uh, with countries. Well, thank you for that, and, and good luck in, uh, in putting this in place and getting it to work. And with regard to the, the RST, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, hopefully your biggest member is going to uh, yes. provide some financial support with some of those uh, SDRs. Well, another issue that's very live, uh, of course, is one that I think every, virtually every one of your members' central banks is looking at the issue of digital currencies and the allied issue of fintech. Mm. Uh, are you expecting much progress anytime soon, some changes, uh, some ad adaptations or some adoptions or issuance of uh, central bank digital currencies? And how is it going to affect the fund? And how is the fund going to aid its members in deciding what to do? But this is a hot topic in the world and at the fund. Uh, it is hot topic because uh, the sheer speed with which digitalization is impacting the world of assets and money is lifting it up. Uh, we have today some $2 trillion in crypto assets. Crypto assets are unbank unbanked uh, in, the, in this sense, they're not exactly money, they're actually not money, but they're an attractive investment uh, where technology allows to offer a new product. Uh, and that uh, tokenization of, of assets uh, is uh, way beyond money. What is within the universe of money are stable coins, e-money, the oldest way in which digitalization impacted uh, financial transactions uh, and uh, central bank digital currencies. On the issue of stable coins, what we see is uh, again, expansion, but not yet matching crypto assets expansion. So I can't give you an exact number. My colleagues are telling me maybe 200 billion, maybe it's moving a bit uh, further. And these are, why are they not expanding uh, very quickly? Because they are backed by assets. So uh, you expect that a, a, a stable coin, it's really stable, can be exchanged one-to-one -to, -one to fiat currency. Uh, for example, the US uh, uh, coin is guaranteed one-to-one. -to -one. Now, some of the stable coins are <laughs> less stable. The asset backing is not as secured. But because you need this asset backing, then the, the expansion is uh, not as fast as with uh, crypto assets. And then we go to central bank digital currencies. And again, quite amazing development. We surveyed our membership and we found out that over a hundred countries are at some stage of investigating, piloting, and some already launching uh, CBDCs. And uh, these are big economies. Um, we know China is on this list. We know India is on this uh, list. We know the US has taken a decision to look into a digital uh, dollar. So does uh, uh, the Eurozone. 
where, who are the first to cross the finish line? Or the Bahamas. Uh, and the Bahamas actually got their sand over just before they had a uh, hurricane. And they can test in reality that it is helpful to have it uh, for a country of multiple islands and difficulty to, to carry uh, fiat currency from one place uh, to another. For us at the fund, we have presented to our board of directors our digital money strategy. And uh, it was very interesting. The uh, countries that were very enthusiastic about it and extremely supportive, emerging markets, developing uh, economies, mostly because of the leapfrogging opportunity they see, the need to continue to expand financial inclusion and using uh, CBDCs for that purpose. Uh, the, the advanced economies were supportive, but less, less so, obviously, well advanced financial systems and use of uh, fiat uh, currencies. What we provide to our membership, three things. One, analysis, including comparative analysis. We wrote a very uh, thoughtful, very thorough paper comparing six countries at different stages of uh, uh, CBDCs. We offer capacity development. If you are interested, these are the skills you need. And we offer countries a chance to think through, support to think through, why do they want it? What is the purpose? Before they decide on technology, we are very engaged on the issue of, of interoperability for CBDCs and very engaged on the issue of regulation for uh, stable coins and for for um, uh, crypto assets, because we think if CBDCs do not have built-in interoperability, there would be fragmentation. And if there is no regulation, uh, then the uh, stable coins and, and crypto assets can cause, can have higher risks and be actually more of a problem than, than of a support. So uh, moving, Fast. Indeed, indeed. Well, you grew up in a, in Bulgaria, part of Comic Con, so you know what a fragmented economic and financial world was like to live. Uh, like you say, the challenge of the time, the fund was established to create a multilateral financial system open and uh, efficient and reliable and rules-based. And now all this is under challenge. Uh, you have uh, a new team. You have a new first deputy managing director. You have a new economic counselor and you have really uh, top rate uh, uh, colleagues mm. in fiscal affairs, in the uh, MCM, uh, how are you gonna take this high powered team and with the support of members push for the funds basic goals, multilateral open yeah. rules-based system in amidst all these difficulties? We, you started uh, by saying I lived uh, on the other side of the iron curtain. I know what it is. Uh, I hated it. It was uh, lonely and inefficient. And uh, when, I, when I look forward, I really hope that we would find a way to prevent a uh, fragmentation of that kind, a new Cold War that impacts our economies. Uh, I know that globalization has not served everybody. They are winners, they are losers. I know there are lessons we have to draw and we have to make sure that what we offer to people is fairer, more transparent, more inclusive, that those who win have a better framework to share their benefits uh, with those who do to lose. But it is a you know, uh, phrase we often use in an environment like this, don't throw the baby with the bathwater. Well, that applies here so much. Look at what we have gained since 
I managed and everybody around me, we all managed to move across the Iron Curtain. The world economy tripled since 1990. And the emerging markets developing economies were the big beneficiaries. They increased four and a half times. We saw shrinkage of poverty from 2 billion to what is still very high, 650 million, and they may have gotten uh, uh, more because of the last two years. But it is still a much, much more uh, prosperous uh, uh, world. How to overcome the uh, differences in, in uh, value propositions, in objectives, in the way we see each other, it's not going to be at all easy. But I, am, I hope that an institution like the fund, we have a universe, almost universal membership, 190 members, that we can build bridges. So on the big issues that affect the directions uh, to travel for the world, we can come together. We can come together on tackling the uh, food crisis, the risk of a debt crisis, the climate crisis, and find what unites us to be sufficiently strong to keep us functioning in a more uh, integrated, uh, coordinated fashion. Uh, is this going to be uh, possible? Well, it depends on uh, determination. And I, I think of leaders, what would I tell them? I guess I would say, well, think what is best for your people. Is it best for your people to be in their um, block, isolated, culturally less diverse world and uh, less prosperous world? Or it is better for your people that we find ways to build these uh, bridges. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Treasury Secretary of the US uh, at the establishment of the Woods said something really, really smart. He said, prosperity like peace is indivisible. So if we want this, we have to be indivisible ourselves. We have to act uh, uh, together. Thank you for, the, for those words. I think we have time for just uh, one or two questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, Emily Slater, our executive director, if you could step in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, John. And, and thank you to the MD. Um, we, we do have a, a couple of questions. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to kind of summarize here. Um, one question is, is on the IMF assistance to Ukraine. Uh, if you could elaborate a little bit further on, yeah. on what you're doing and, and how you can do more uh, on, on a scale that, that will really uh, be meaningful given the challenges. Um, and then the second question is a continuation of this uh, conversation around sort of decoupling and, and how do we uh, promote the values of a rules-based system that uh, were designed at, at Bretton Woods. And we talked a lot about this in our morning session as well. Um, and, uh, you know, you have uh, spoken of a, of a new Bretton Woods moment uh, post-pandemic. Um, and Secretary Yellen uh, just this week gave a speech uh, calling for a, a new Bretton Woods mm -hmm. uh, to really uh, rethink the framework and the philosophies and, and to modernize the institutions to be fit for purpose going forward. Um, so maybe if you could say a few words on, on how you are thinking uh, mm -hmm. about that. Uh, thank you for the uh, questions on the IMF support to Ukraine. Uh, let me first say that we have been engaged in Ukraine for a long time. Uh, we had a uh, fairly effective program in place. Uh, we disbursed um, 800 million in December. We were about to disburse uh, on the basis of completing a, re a review when the war started. Uh, we also provided Ukraine with 2.7 billion of uh, dollars of special drawing rights. They came very handy for the country. Because the work on the program was interrupted by, by, by brutal war, we moved to provide Ukraine with emergency financing, $1.4 billion. This is to keep the country in a position to support social services, the functioning of the economy, and uh, we also have created a trust 
administered by the fund where Canada has already deposited $1 billion as a guarantee to help uh, Ukraine and it's open to, to others if they are interested to contribute. Our main uh, support for Ukraine goes through two channels. One, our team works very closely with the uh, economic team of Ukraine on retaining macroeconomic and financial stability despite of the uh, war. And I want to praise the Ukrainian uh, economic team for doing a really good job in this uh, uh, regard. Uh, we want to, secondly, to recognize that even if the war goes on, uh, on uh, there are parts of Ukraine that are not affected where the economy can function. And it is important for Ukraine to receive support for building the country and keeping uh, businesses uh, uh, functioning, even if the war is not quite yet over. And of course, prepare the pathway for the rebuilding of the country. I had a very constructive, very good call with President Zelensky this weekend. And these were the two topics we talked about, how to make sure that macroeconomic stability is sustained, that the country doesn't slip into an inflationary spiral because of uh, printing money to pay salaries, how, how we have that uh, priority uh, uh, in mind, and then how we go about rebuilding the country or continuing to build the country and build the governance of the country, build the uh, competitiveness of the economy uh, over time. Uh, I would put in parentheses, I have family in the second largest city of Ukraine, Kharkiv. Uh, it is bombed, but where they live, it is uh, uh, an area that has not been bombed yet. And they tell me that in this area that has been spared so far, they are cleaning the streets and even planting trees and flowers just to convey that there is a country that cares of you know the people that live there that sense of of we are not giving up on our lives uh, and and i can tell you that really touched me uh, a lot uh, talking about and by the way there would be a meeting on ukraine that the world bank uh, is hosting and of course we will participate this week uh, on the question of, uh, of uh, uh, decoupling and uh, the risk of it, I mean, exactly because I lived on the other side of the Iron Curtain, I also know that we didn't sh share the same uh, values in the same economic system. So how do you connect if that is uh, absent? And therefore the risk uh, of decoupling, the risk of fragmentation comes if we are not able to build something that we all share. Uh, and what is it the thing we need to build? Obviously, ru rule of law. So can we do it despite of some differences? Is that possible? I think uh, uh, you know, risks are, are, are there that it may, may be very, very difficult. But we should not give up on trying to find that anchor what is best for people everywhere? Uh, and on a very um, a personal note, I, I'm a big believer that when there is a will, there is a way. And that if we only have more women heads of states and prime ministers <laughs> and presidents, maybe it would be easier to do. <laughs> Emily, I'll let you take that. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, uh, and I think we're at time now. Um, so I, I very much appreciate you uh, joining us today and, and being very generous with your time. It must be uh, an incredibly busy week, even even more so than normal, given the gravity of the challenges we've, we've just discussed here. Um, so thank you very much for joining us again, Managing Director John. As always, thank you for expertly moderating. And just want to remind our audience that our annual meeting will continue tomorrow afternoon at 3.15 p.m., uh, with a conversation with World Bank President David Malpass and Bill Rhodes. So we hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you once again to the Managing Director for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.